the government does not listen to domestic phone calls without court approval. To put it mildly, AT&T has not been forthright with the American people or its customers about what it is doing. How many Americans have had their phone conversations recorded or their emails intercepted without a court order? Any idea? You're asking about the operations of this program, and I, I really can't get into it. In the last year, Americans began to learn of unprecedented efforts by the U.S. government to monitor the behavior of those who live within the country's borders. The National Security Agency was reported to be tapping into some of the American telecom system's main arteries without court approval. Tracing and analyzing large volumes of phone calls and email traffic and eavesdropping on specific conversations. AT&T declined our request for an interview, but a spokesman made a general statement to the press. AT&T does not provide customer information to law enforcement agencies or government agencies without legal authorization. Verizon would not confirm or deny whether it had any relationship to the NSA wiretapping and said it had not provided the NSA with any customer phone records or call data. While the involvement of U.S. telecom companies in the NSA's effort remains unclear, one thing is not. In the post-9-11 world, the federal government has come to rely on corporate America to be its ally on the war on terror by providing data that can be crucial in determining who is a risk. And in a world where almost everything that anyone does can be measured or monitored, that data keeps growing. Still, many people in this country, when asked of their concerns about privacy, answer with the same refrain. Why should I worry when I have nothing to hide? I honestly don't understand how these people can do this and cause so much harm. For me, That's what Adam Music believed harm. before he learned his cell phone records were being monitored by a private investigator. I would never have even thought about this whole thing with the NSA now and the whole government thing. To me, I would have been behind it 110 percent. Well, Mr. Yusik, we appreciate your testimony and certainly understand your intensity and the way you feel about it. Living through this experience is changing my point of view on this dramatically because here, you know, somebody went out and is stealing something of mine, attempting to use it against me, is potentially putting me in harm's way with my own information, and nobody seems to, to be able to say that it's a clear problem, that it's a clear legal issue. How is this possible? In the new world, with all these new technologies, records are being created of activities that used to be wholly private. Those records are no longer held solely in one's home, where you have constitutional protection from search or seizure under the Fourth Amendment. They are now held by countless businesses that intersect our lives so-called third parties, to which the Fourth Amendment does not apply. This is exactly what the founders wanted to prevent. They wanted to prevent the government from searching everybody, just casting a big wide net and seeing who gets snagged in the net. They wanted to stop that. That's what the Fourth Amendment's about. However, the Supreme Court decided in the 1970s that if a third party has your information, you don't have an expectation of privacy in that information. And therefore, you don't get any Fourth Amendment protection. The future promises to bring ever more invasive technology. But what we used to see in, in films is becoming a reality. Ideas that were once the province of science fiction what the hell are, you doing to me? are today a part of everyday life. In early 2006, a number of employees of a video surveillance company called City Watchers in Cincinnati, Ohio, were implanted with microchips. They make a small incision in your arm where the actual chip is then implanted subcutaneously under your skin. 
Call the lady and have her type in what is my IP. CEO call. Sean Dark thought security at the company would be enhanced if its workers implanted the chips, which allow people to identify themselves by holding their arm in front of a scanner. It's not big brotherish because it there's no information about you on the chip. It's tied to a database within the company that says this person is allowed to come into the facility. Scott Silverman is the CEO of Applied Digital, the owner of Verichip. The Delray Beach, Florida company develops, manufactures, and markets the chips, which are primarily used for animal tracking and medical patients who may need them in order to communicate with a doctor in an emergency situation. The scanner powers up, wave it over the arm, pulls up the unique 16-digit identification number, and through a serial port that's at the bottom of the scanner, it goes to a computer or a laptop where immediately my picture, my driver's license information, and my relevant medical records would pop up on the screen. Those that fear the big brother aspect, the government's going to make sure that everyone has one of these chips and they're going to be able to track your every move, there's no location technology in this whatsoever. Implantable chips sound scary, but a lot of people say it really shouldn't, you shouldn't be concerned about it. Would you be? I think so. I think that there are good uses and there are bad uses of this technology. I think one thing about the chips is what if they can be read by someone and how far can they be read? Currently, they can't be read at a great distance, but what if they could? In the future, we can't assume they're going to stay the same. In the future, little will stay the same. Galileo is about to be deployed and its coverage will be worldwide right from the start. The Galileo satellite navigation system, scheduled to be launched in 2008, will take surveillance to a whole new level. It will offer positioning accurate to within two meters, whereas GPS is accurate only to within 15 meters. This precision will not only allow existing services to be improved, but also new uses to be developed. No doubt, many of those uses will provide benefits. But those same advances come with risks. With each advance comes an added threat were the technology to be abused. Will the technology used today to help combat crime be used tomorrow to clamp down on free speech or political dissent? Dr. Attic, one of the fathers of biometrics, knows the nefarious possibilities that technology provides. I read a quote from you saying, that 50 years down the line, when I look at my life's achievements, I don't want to be the person that people say, well, he's like the guy who invented the atomic bomb. And this is a powerful technology. And therefore, as is the case with any other powerful technology, we have to insist on a responsible use. Charles Morgan, the leader of one of the country's largest data mining companies, also has his apprehensions. We're all concerned. I mean, I'm concerned if the government misuses this stuff. I mean, you know, we all like, you know, we're fearing, fearful of Big Brother. I'm not very worried that that'll happen because there's going to be so much oversight. Privacy advocates don't believe there's been enough oversight. It's going to be critical over the next 10 years to try to establish a balance between individuals' privacy rights and the ability of government to get our personal information. And what we do in this next 10 years is going to control our privacy for generations. The law that regulates electronic surveillance, the last major restructuring of that law took place in 1986. We need a regulatory infrastructure to protect privacy and right now we don't quite have one to match the new technologies that we have. The public needs to be putting pressure on state and federal legislators to do something about this. It's important that the public become aware of what is going on so its voice can be heard.